afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I'm so delighted that you could join us today. And um, oh, I've just been handed an official note that says there's coffee and cookies at two o'clock after this next door. So you earn your reward by being here. Uh, so I want to welcome you to uh, the next in our series of Coastlines programs. Um, which are part of a larger initiative called Humanities and the Environment. And uh, today we have a guest who, when we were contemplating a series that looked at the geography, cartography, and sort of metaphysical idea of coastlines, we immediately thought that this scholar who's joining us today needed to be on our list because he's actually written a book called Coastlines. And um, my students who are joining us here today from the Oceans class, I hope that what he's talking about today is going to resonate with some of the things we've talked about this semester. And before I forget, actually, on a housekeeping note, if you're here from my class, as you're leaving, uh, please put a little slip with your name and your name tag number and just hand it to Michael or myself on your way out at the end of the lecture, okay? So uh, I'll, have, I'll, I'll know you were present. Um, so I'd like to just start with briefly introducing our guest. Marc Monnier is the distinguished, I just pronounced that wrong, didn't I? Yes. Uh, Marc Monnier. <laughs> Marc Monnier, excuse me. Well, wait a minute. The worst I've ever heard is Juan Manure. Oh. <laughs> that really Marc Monnier. It looks French, but it's not quite pronounced that way is the Distinguished Professor of Geography at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and editor of Volume 6 of the History of Cartography. He's been the editor of the American Cartographer and president of the American Cartographic Association and served on many important panels such as the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, he received his PhD in geography from Penn State and has taught then in Rhode Island as well as SUNY Albany before going to Syracuse. He's the author of, count them, 17 books, including coastlines that I mentioned, as well as a very fascinating book called How to Lie with Maps, Air Apparent, How Meteorologists Learn to Map, Predict, and Dramatize Weather, and another one that sounds fascinating called No Dig, No Fly, No Go, How Maps Restrict and Control. So I can't le read you all 17 titles, but I think you get the idea that he's doing some very fascinating work. And today he's going to be sharing with us uh, his thoughts on coastal cartography. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, thanks for showing up this afternoon. Um, I don't know how this audiovisual system is working out. I'm used to talking in a room this big without a, without a mic, so I guess if it seems to be shouting at people, you can turn it down. Um, basically, as Jennifer pointed out, one of the books that I've written is called Coastlines, and I specifically titled this so that the word is actually two words, coast and lines because um, from the standpoint of cartography, what we're talking about actually is lines or maps, uh, which would represent shorelines. Um, one principle I have is that there are really four significant cartographic coastlines. And um, uh, you can read what's up here. Um, I can sometimes lose track of time. It's good to see that there's a clock in the back of the room. This class runs until when? What? Two, okay, Th that's perfect because I'm used to, used to teaching for 80 minutes, so. Um, any event, um, uh, the first one, the uh, visible shoreline, otherwise known as the high water line, is the coastline that was sketched by early explorers um, from offshore from a boat. And we see this example, which is from a diary of Christopher A. Columbus, which, uh, who was mentioned in the subtitle of this talk. Um, he basically um, um, sailed around the uh, northern coast of Haiti 
1493. And one wonders, you know, I mean, how accurate can you be? Well, one thing you can do is to basically superimpose that line on a, a map of the corresponding coast from the Central Intelligence Agency. And uh, we, one can see that, you know, except for maybe some problems, I was afraid that this was going to um, say maybe around there and that cape over there, uh, Columbus more or less got it right. We can assume, of course, that the CIA got it right. Uh, they don't always. Um, but um, in terms of the uh, high water line, or the Explorer's Coastline, we can look at this map, which is Martin Volksmuller's uh, 1507 uh, world map, which uh, about you know, roughly 10 years ago was purchased by the U.S. Library of Congress. Um, somebody donated uh, very nicely several million dollars. Um, and uh, this is a particularly important part of their our collection because they build this as America's birth certificate because this is the first map that uh, had the word America on it. Um, and you can see, however, that as, uh, as an accurate representation or let's say as uh, a contemporary representation of the world's coastline, it uh, leaves quite a bit, bit to be uh, desired there. And, um, uh, but cartographic historians uh, like to look at this kind of map because they can be very useful in, in, in showing the extent of knowledge about the uh, world. I mean, where the coastline is relatively accurate, you know, probably those coasts would have been explored reasonably well, reasonably thoroughly. Um, there are some interesting anomalies that one finds. Uh, this is from a 1650 map that shows California as an island. Um, some people, I guess, like to think of it as such even now. Uh, this particular view uh, per persisted for nearly 100 years because sometimes once something gets on a map, people tend to say, okay, that's right, we trust maps. And um, it was only when, I think, a, a Jesuit explorer actually walked around um, uh, the uh, Gulf uh, there, uh, the, Gulf, uh, the Gulf of California, uh, that um, they were able to uh, convince others that California is not an island. Uh, in terms of the uh, distinction I make between the first and second coastline, uh, the first coastline being the high water line, you can see from offshore, the, um, the second coastline is the low water line used as the tidal datum. We can go to um, the Bay of Fundy, um, and this is an area near the Bay of Fundy, uh, which works out very nicely because we can actually see the high water shoreline here. We can see the low water shoreline there. You have some uh, very strong tides, so you get a relatively um, wide um, intertidal zone there, which uh, sort of helps you if you're trying to put the same thing on both maps. Generally speaking, and we, and we can also see this in somewhat more detail, how many of you know about Five Islands up in Maine? Very nice area that's um, uh, somewhere to the east of Bath. But, but um, um, you can see uh, that on a relatively detailed uh, coastal map, you see uh, not only, let's say, um, uh, tidal flats like this, which um, in a normal tidal cycle would be covered and then uncovered, uh, but you also see a variety of different rocks offshore which are hazards. And one of the um, important challenges in coastal mapping is basically documenting these hazards to navigation. Basically places, you know, you don't want to sail a ship. Um, and uh, some of these would be uh, at the surface. Uh, some of these would be uh, below the water surface. And uh, you know, if you strike a pinnacle rock, uh, you're going to know if it's going to rip a hole on the bottom of your boat. Uh, there's, there's a very um, intriguing way in which they actually uh, detected these. Um, this is before sonar, you know, where you basically had two boats uh, go along, and they had sort of a drag line, and um, it was uh, below the water. But when they encountered something like this, it would sort of um, 
jerk some uh, floats that they have on the surface. Um, there are a variety of different datums. Um, and by the way, the plural of datum is datums. Sounds like you're talking to a child. Um, uh, this is a term that geodesists use, coastal mappers use. And um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but you can see that it becomes a, a political in the sense uh, that there are different dividing lines represented by different states. And um, these things also refer to issues of, of uh, who are controls or who can buy and sell land, which is in a coastal area. Um, and also issues relating to beach access. This is, um, I think, a useful example because we can have the low water shoreline here, which serves as an anchor for the territorial sea. Basically, this is the area um, off a nation's coast um, that is actually a part of national territory. And um, uh, if somebody brings a boat there, um, uh, you know, from well, I guess from any place, um, it, it would be subject to a search and, and seizure, possibly. Um, so we have a situation here where the typical thing is to identify points that are relatively far out and sort of draw circles. And um, you can get the limit of the territorial sea. It used to be uh, three miles, now it's 12 statute miles. There have been some situations where some nations like uh, Peru have tried to have really, uh, you know, extremely broad and extensive claims which were not recognized, but uh, caused some problems for a while when they seized the U.S. ship. Um, the uh, Department of State has this little uh, diagram uh, in one of its publications pointing out that uh, we can have anchored to the low water shoreline, uh, the outer limit of the territorial sea. What this points out is that there is a significant value to having offshore islands because basically offshore islands give you something which is out there around which you can have a territorial sea. And um, so uh, also too, um, there is such a thing as a median line. And the reason why a median line would be important is that um, uh, there's something called the Convention of the Law of the Sea. And uh, there are, um, there is what is known as an exclusive economic zone, which is an area roughly 200 nautical miles off a nation's shoreline where that particular nation has control over, let's say, fishing and uh, subsurface mining. Uh, when I say, you know, in general there are situations where you can actually have a somewhat broader um, exclusive economic zone extending out onto uh, the continental shelf. Um, it makes for some interesting possibilities, uh, such as this, uh, because there is a maritime boundary between the United States and uh, Venezuela. And um, uh, these, these are typically negotiated by treaty so that they're recognized by the two nations. Venezuela has a number of islands down here. They have one up there. Is there a pointer over here? Oh, this is for drawing on that. Does this work? I, I'm not sure. Uh, well, let me find out. Um, uh, it's not working. That's not working. OK. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, boy. Um, this got caught. And, and I think, is there another battery in there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. With the battery, it's fine. <laughs> what could go wrong next? Wait and see. Uh, totally didn't break. Still working. Okay, great. Thanks very much. No problem. So, inside pocket, will that work? Might work a little bit better. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Still? Now? Uh, what I was going to say is that I'm not that tall. Um, and, uh, but you can see there's an Isla Avis, probably not pronouncing that correctly, which basically helps in that area 
to extend the exclusive economic zone of uh, Venezuela. And uh, these all would be less, I guess, than, than 200 nautical miles. You can see, on the other hand, St. Croix uh, obviously helps uh, the U.S. That stops because you're getting out to an area where there's where the boundary between the uh, Netherlands um, and Venezuela would become more important. Um, they actually represent this by uh, a series of so-called turning points uh, that, that join um, um, uh, great circle lines, um, turning points at which great circle line segments meet. Okay, So you can actually represent this nu nu numerically so that you can have a situation, let's say somebody's sailing out there, they have a GPS, and the uh, navigation system you know, can tell you, if you want to know it, you know, where um, the uh, point at which you might be encroaching on some other country's uh, exclusive economic zone. You can look at the uh, Pacific, and the United States has a number of territories there. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side of this, the North Mariana Islands, uh, which the United States owns, and uh, this is an interesting uh, fact because it points out that there's a maritime boundary between uh, Japan and the U.S. And you don't generally think of these things, but uh, uh, there still, you know, is, uh, I guess, in that neck of the woods, a fair amount of open sea, um, high seas. Um, this uh, shows you another um, application of the principle. You can see the uh, 200 nautical mile coastline around the northern part of Russia. Um, you can see also that zone in there which represents a Russian claim uh, that has not been um, internationally accepted, but it is argued. Uh, the idea here is that you can extend your exclusive economic zone outward farther beyond 200 nautical miles if this goes onto the continental shelf. So the argument here is that there is a continental shelf there. But what you also see is um, at least one straight line going directly to the North Pole. And uh, that's what uh, geopoliticians, um, uh, uh, or let's say people who uh, study geopolitics, recognize as an application of sector theory. Uh, sector theory could also be sort of um, the same principle that's involved in slicing a, a pizza. There's a center somewhere, and you draw a line outward from the center, and then you get sort of a slice like that. And that's been applied uh, quite extensively for Antarctica, um, where uh, up until about 1959, um, there were, um, seven Antarctic claimants uh, that um, claimed that they owned uh, a slice of Antarctica that would actually extend um, as, far, uh, as far north as 60 degrees south. There was an area over there that, that, as you can see, was not claimed. You can also see there's some interesting um, problems because um, you had overlapping claims. And uh, islands uh, turned out to be important here because basically, if the South Pole is here, and if you're a country, let's say, like Argentina, and if you have an island way out here, this gives you a chance to sort of anchor a sector line way out there so that you can get a larger slice of the Antarctic pie. How many of you have heard of the Falkland Islands? Okay, in, in, in what context did you hear about it? The Falkland War. The Falkland War, yeah, okay. You know, why did Britain go to war with, with Argentina? <clears throat> In fact, or why did the Argentine, Argentinians try to take it? And um, there um, is a long-standing uh, feeling on the part of Argentina that because it's relatively close to our coast, it is ours. And uh, you have a situation where even now, in a contemporary Argentinian maps, um, even though these Antarctic claims um, have been put on ice, as it were, by the uh, Treaty of, of uh, 1959, you, you find a situation where they're still claiming, is Argentina up here, this wider slice of Antarctica. 
sort of anchoring it by um, uh, lines through um, uh, the uh, Falklands and also South Georgia. Um, another CIA map, uh, this shows you the Norwegian claim. And you can see here, uh, Norway is the only claimant that um, had an uncertain extent. All of the other claims go as far north as 60 degrees south. Um, and um, this is almost a historic artifact. Uh, there's a possibility, I guess, that you know, maybe the um, treaty um, which was established um, as part of the International Geophysical Year, um, there's a possibility, I guess, that this treaty might fall apart. The, the treaty is useful, among other things, in basically um, prohibiting the um, shipment of nuclear waste to Antarctica. And uh, that could probably be an extremely attractive idea because nobody wants to have it. And, uh, and at the same time, you know, um, um, there's no source of energy which is totally um, uh, uh, a non-hazardous. But you can see here on this map um, that Norway's claim is really just a cartographic fiction. You know, I mean, it's an interesting historic artifact, and um, I don't know whether the Norwegians these days are, are particularly, you know, enthusiastic about it. The Argentinians, though, certainly are. But you can see um, on the general map of the Antarctica, basically a variety of nations had research stations there, and there was apparently no problem with this. And um, and there uh, presumably will continue not to be any problem with it. I want to move now to a discussion of the third coastline, basically um, of the kind that you find on coastal inundation maps. And uh, the third coastline is associated with uh, storm surge, it's associated with hazard zone maps, it's associated with uh, flood insurance maps, and uh, it's generated um, by um, a combining climatological data with data about the existing um, shoreline, with uh, data about elevations in the near shore area, and also um, information about the seafloor just offshore. And, um, uh, these maps are what I would call social uh, constructions. Uh, they're not perfect. They um, have a lot of flaws. There's a lot of uncertainty there. But these maps are made because it is recognized that it's advisable to have regulations that basically limit what people can build near on the coastline, and also to have an insurance program. Insurance programs basically, well, what's the alternative to having a coastal flood insurance program? One thing we can do is, okay, somebody has a house on the shoreline, a hurricane comes along, uh, knocks it down, all their properties washed away, say, ah, tough, you shouldn't have built there. TS, Navy term means tough situation. Um, but but um, another thing, on the, other, uh, on, the, on the other hand, would be to say for the, for the government to rush in, okay, we're going to help everybody. No matter what it takes, okay, we're going to help you rebuild. Well, an insurance scheme is somewhere in between there. The idea here is that we're trying to recognize that there is probably some kind of national responsibility for helping to rebuild basic infrastructure, you know, roads, things like that, but also to help people who own property who who have homes to be able to insure themselves. So there is a flood insurance fund, and people can uh, contribute to this fund by basically buying flood insurance, and when something happens, happens, they can be reimbursed. And another thing, as a result of the policy, however, is that you can impose land use regulations. The idea is not to have people building in the high hazard zone. The idea is that if you want to build really close to the shoreline, close at elevation, you're going to have to pay much more for your flood insurance than if you have your house built on higher ground. How many of you have been into the Outer Banks of North Carolina? Anybody? What do you see down there? 
Houses on stilts, okay? You actually, do you have any of those on Long Island? I know they have them down in New Jersey. The idea here, you know, is that, okay, you want to build here, you're not necessarily going to fill in with dirt, but basically you're going to have pilings, you can build the house up high, <coughs> and the actual operative elevation is the elevation of your first living floor. Um, storm surge can be brutal. Basically, um, you have wind, um, driving water onto the land. Uh, you would normally maybe have some wave action. That's why people go to the seashore, because you, you can sort of dance around in how the waves. When you get a strong wind driving water onto the shore, you get maybe something like this, or perhaps even worse. So you can you know, have a seawall. The seawall is not that high. Basically, water can go over it and it can slam against buildings, and it can undermine buildings, and you can have a real mess. Um, to give you an idea of what uh, flood insurance maps look like, um, the acronym FIRM means Flood Insurance Rate Map. You can go to a FEMA website that can allow you to download, or actually to create and download what's called a, a, a digital firmet. Um, Firmet being sort of like a small customized flood insurance rate map, which is focused on a specific area, and you can actually get sort of some, some panels like this, where it, it, it uh, typically, I guess, um, in the process of modernizing this, but uh, for, for some areas still, what you get is a chunk of an existing flood insurance rate map that had been sort of drawn on paper, printed, and also scanned. And um, you actually would get something that would sort of look like this. For the book, I thought it might be better to sort of actually draw something that you know, looked a little bit neater. And then for a slide for a talk like this, I thought it would be a good idea to actually uh, put in um, the first shoreline um, uh, and also the third shoreline. Now, the third shoreline here is the storm surge line. This is the storm surge line associated with a 100-year flood. What's a 100-year flood? Anybody? 100-year flood. This is the flood that comes every 100 years, right? You know, so you, you know, if you had it two years ago, OK, 98 <laughs> years, <laughs> breathe easy. No, OK? This basically is a flood with an average annual frequency of 1 per percent. And, uh, you know, well, how does one figure that out? Well, it's a lot of numbers. And uh, you can say that it's maybe a little bit of hocus pocus. You uh, try to do this systematically. Uh, hence the notion of it, you know, it is a social construction because this kind of a map, you know, is a best guess, but it is only, I mean, maybe calling it a uh, guess is not that good. You say best guess, and that's reasonable. Um, this is a process which is, you know, really uh, fraught with uncertainty. Uh, when you try to, to uh, work out a flood map, let's say, uh, for a riverine flooding, you know, um, there's a river which is flowing down here. Uh, well, there are some places, you know, where you have stream gauging stations, and you might have maybe 38, 40 years of record uh, where you have a stream gauge. So you can basically use some quantitative models where you can extrapolate that experience into uh, the future. Then you can basically take um, the estimated 1% flood, the height of the estimated 1% flood, in places where you have a stream gauging station. And you can use an interpolation process where you can sort of follow that downstream between this gauging station and some other gauging station, almost as if you were straightening out that stream and drawing something like a straight line. And then for any point along this stream, you can then move at right angles out until you hit land. And where you hit land, then you have the boundary of the 1% flood zone. I almost said 100-year 100, 100 flood zone, OK? Uh, that's a notion we really you know, probably should try to get away from. But you find you know, coastal scientists, uh, hydrologists using it all the time. And as long as you know what it means, as long as you don't misinterpret it, it's probably not going to cause any problems. A problem with doing this um, for riverine floods is that the period of record you have, you know, 38 or 40 years, 
might not be terribly representative of what's going to happen is, uh, when you go into uh, the future. The problem is that might, but there, there might have been new construction there. New construction means roads, roofs for houses, driveways, things like that, impervious surfaces, which means that rain, when it falls, is not going to as readily <coughs> infiltrate into groundwater, but it's going to, you know, well, it's going to go fairly quickly into runoff. Another thing uh, that um, uh, that might not be included here is basically climate change, and as a result, let's say, of warming temperatures, um, um, which um, the evidence seems to be pretty strong now, is that this is very much affecting climate, and uh, oh, it's causing uh, more disastrous storms on land. Oh, as well as at sea. And uh, you know, so if we have estimates that are based upon old data or obsolete data, and the data would be obsolete uh, in part because, um, in part because um, the climate is actually changing, we have some other data that are obsolete because we have more accurate ways of, of estimating elevation differences. And some of the early flood maps, some of the flood maps that are in use now, are based upon geological survey topographic maps, where people maybe used photogrammetry and you know, they drew contour lines, and um, those maps have an accuracy where at any one point, there's a pretty good chance that you're within one half a contour interval of the right value. And uh, you know, for a lot of purposes, that's not good what's not good enough. In any event, uh, let's look at some other things associated with coastal maps. Um, we're concerned not only with flood insurance, we're concerned, let's say, with e evacuation planning. This is a portion of a map down around Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, basically, the redder it is, the more ominous, uh, ominous the, uh, the situation is. Red is a color customarily associated with the danger. And they're concerned uh, here uh, with um, recognizing that there, uh, if you read it, there's some roads which are identified as being four-lane highways. They're concerned with some sort of local low points where they actually indicate a spot elevation figure uh, because what you don't want to do is where the water, let's say, is up to nine feet, um, you don't want to have people, let's say, going past that point um, because the road might be underwater. Uh, these uh, typically would be referred to as choke points. Here's something the students in my hazard class um, are a little bit uncertain about until they go through the exercise a few times, until I talk about it a few times. This is a slosh basin. And slosh is an acronym for sea, lakes, and overland surge from hurricanes. Um, I suspect that in coming up with the name of the model, they were probably trying simultaneously to figure out you know, what would be a good acronym for it. But what you see is a network here, and it, well, it's based upon a kind of polar coordinate grid. <coughs> um, they're, they're, uh, we have a center up there. This is a section of coastline. Slosh basins are developed for particular sections of coast. Sections, you know, where there would be, say, maybe a lot of human settlement around. Sections, you know, where there would be a strong a demand for, for, for flood insurance. Uh, where there would be a strong need uh, for stringent land use regulations. You can see we have these little cells here. And these cells typically have two straight sides. Where the straight sides are lines which are converge at the center of the slush basin. And we have two sides which are curved. And um, the idea here, well, the slush modeling process started back um, roughly around um, the uh, early 1970s. And I don't know how many of you have uh, you know, read anything about the history of our computers. Basically, there's a little a computer which is sitting up here now. And to have that kind of a computing power, we'd probably take you know, a room sort of on this size where you would have a lot of machinery with vacuum tubes, you have to have a massive air conditioner, and 
the amount of memory available was relatively small and uh, the processing speed was relatively small. But the idea here is that you're using something like this, these little cells, <coughs> to simulate the impact of a severe coastal storm. Okay? Now, um, how do we do this? Well, <coughs> you can think of a situation where you can where you can get some climatological data for the area. And you can get, like maps, estimates of past storm tracks. And you can get some information about <coughs> the, um, the intensity of, of a low pressure cell, the storm center as it moves through this area. And what you can do is to simulate a number of plausible storms. Storms that have happened, storms that might be like those which have happened. And you can see there's a fair amount of guesswork here. <coughs> but for each simulation, you basically have a situation where you are moving the center of the storm. Because basically a hurricane is a large rotating storm. Okay? And basically, you have a counterclockwise pattern of circulation around our, our this moving center. And not too much wind right near the center because this is where you have the eye. But when you get beyond the eye wall, then you have very intense winds. As you get farther and farther out, the intensity of wind is going to drop down until you're you know, actually beyond the edge of the storm system. So try and think of a situation where you're trying to simulate this, where you're stepping are this model forward in time and let's say maybe we had a storm track which might have been right across here at each point as we would move this forward in a relatively small increment of time we would construct a hypothetical wind field and that hypothetical wind field would show you the direction and intensity of wind on the surface because it's this drag per produced by wind moving across the water surface, <coughs> which is going to move this water up onto land. Can you try to appreciate this? Okay. Now, what we're out here, we are not on land. Okay. But we have these little cells, and there's a certain uh, distance between the surface of the cell, the top of the cell, and the seafloor down here represented on a bathymetric map. And you could, by the way, run simulations if you want you know, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, different tidal configurations. The worst thing to have happen is to have strong storm surge at high tide. Okay? So you can take this into your probability work. But at any one of these cells, your, your momentary wind field is going to give you a particular direction and strength of wind, okay? Which could be calculated quantitatively. Well, I'll be calculating things not quantitatively. They can't say what I mean. <laughs> um, think of these little cells as like bank accounts, okay? Because basically when you have wind moving across the surface, it is going to move water from this cell here to that cell there. And you have a situation in which you actually have for each one of these, you have four boundaries. <coughs> so you have usually, say maybe, a like movement out of the cell across two of these boundaries and into the cell across two of these boundaries. And the amount of water is more or less being held constant except, you know, obviously you can have more water which is coming in from the outside of the slush basin. Now, if you have a cell, and I said these are, are sort of like bank accounts, okay? And if you think of, of you know, somebody having a bank account, and if you're depositing money into the bank account, and if you're also withdrawing money from this bank account, a deposit is sort of like moving water into it, a withdrawal is like moving water out of it. When the water moves out of it, by the way, it moves into the adjoining bank account, okay? This is how the simulation model works, okay? 
And um, what happens when you get more water moving into the cell than you have moving out of it? More going in than is moving out. Well, it's going to flow to the other cells, but you're actually going to have a rise in the elevation of the water, okay? Then you also, and they have to take into account this, you can also have kind of a gravity feed because, you know, this, some of this might tend to be sort of moving forward, you know, um, uh, just by gravity, but principally it would be wind drag. Now, you have some cells that are up on land, and what's going to happen? Well, water is going to be pushed onto them. And here, that water basically is going to be, you know, the level of the, of the water is going to rise. You're going to get flooding, okay? So if you can visualize this, you can understand, you know, how you can actually, um, actually create a quantitative model, uh, a so-called finite difference model of storm surge. This is worth spending a little time on just to try to understand it. So you can try and model a variety of different storms. Um, and um, one of the things you might do, and, uh, and this is what you would get from just one simulation for a hurricane moving along that line, where you could figure that, okay, you know, this in this, in this kind of greenish-gray area is where we had inundation and we can actually draw some contour lines representing the uh, degree of flooding. Well, you know, I mean, if we don't have land over here, this obviously, however, I would, I would represent that we have, you know, four more feet of water than we would normally have, okay? So this kind of information is used, run multiple times, to come up with a semi, uh, to, to come up with generalized probabilities, um, well, yeah, I guess, uh, generalized maps, you know, showing a 1% probability of flooding. This slide, and I don't expect everybody to read this, uh, and it probably would work better if we turned out all the lights in here, but you don't have to, but, but it points out that there are some problems. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, this doesn't have to be off very long. Um, uh, but there are some problems uh, with the traditional slotch model. They're, they're old, uh, they're using uh, that uh, highly structured grid uh, that has a very coarse resolution. Um, it doesn't work all that well on long irregular surfaces, but you can read all this. The uh, point is, though, that there are some improved models that you can get. I guess we can bring the lights back up, if you would, please. Um, um, uh, which, which basically provide you with a more accurate representation of the uh, bath bathymetry of the uh, of part of the seafloor and a more accurate representation of the land which is on shore and one of the things which is done here is they use a system whoa I'm sorry okay which is called lidar and lidar um, how many of you heard of lidar lidar is um, light l i detection, which is the D, A for N, and R for ranging, okay? Radar is what? Radio detection when ranging. LIDAR is light detection and ranging. Now, what does LIDAR do? Well, try and envision this, okay? Suppose you have a plane flying over an area. And the plane's flying along, the plane has a GPS on it. And the GPS pro provides it with a very accurate indication of exactly where it is. Where it is in terms of latitude and longitude and elevation. Also, you have an inertial guidance system, which can take a care of you know, some relatively you know, smaller fluctuations in the the actual path of the plane. So you can get a really precise indication of where the plane is and where it's pointed at any one time. The plane's flying along. It is firing at the surface pulsed light beams. And um, these beams are consist of a series of pulses with unique pulses to the extent that when a beam goes down here <coughs> and hits something, 
and is reflected back and is received by a, a very sensitive <coughs> power receiver, the system can tell that the beam which is coming back at this time was the beam that was sent down at that time in that direction from this point. So if, 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 if you think of it like this, at this point here, a beam goes out in a particular direction down to the surface. It's reflected back to the surface. It's received back here. There is a time difference in here between when it was sent out and when it came back. It was known the uh, direction in which it was fired. It was known the elevation and location of the plane at the time it was fired and the time that it was received back. And you do this for thousands and tens of thousands of light beams as you're flying over the area. And for any one of these, you can then calculate how long it took to go down and come back. You know the point here, you know the point there. You can figure out where down here in terms of three-dimensional space this point is, okay? And this could give you what's called a first surface LIDAR map. Now, hold that thought, because we'll come back to that a little bit shortly. Um, I want to show you this, because another thing that is done is we can get uh, a relatively um, a detailed mesh uh, that um, Uh, that is much more accurate than that um, structured polar coordinate grid that you saw with the original slosh model. Okay? And uh, so, you know, this um, was something which gives you much more spatial accuracy. The, uh, this is a triangular integrated network, a so-called TIN. Another thing, by the way, which is an important part of this model, uh, you can identify Z, V zones. The V stands for uh, velocity. This means basically that these would be parts of the land um, uh, just on shore where you actually have wave action. You not only have inundation, you not only have flooding, but you basically have waves actually beating against structures. And uh, the insurance rates would be higher there. There's a diagram here. Uh, those lights are helping much up there, but um, it might help you get a pretty picture of me, but I'm not that interesting. Uh, but what you can see here, you know, there is a situation, oh, thank you. There, there is a situation, there's a little house on stilts, there's one that's not on stilts, it's going to be flooded. Not only that, it's going to be knocked over in waves, or it's going to be battered by all the waves, but on, on uh, flood insurance maps in coastal areas, there's the B zone, and then there's the A zone. And um, uh, generally, there would be certain bands on, on a construction in uh, are the V zones. Here's an example um, you know, of uh, generalized 100-year flood zones down around <coughs> Fort, Fort Myer in Lee County, Florida. And uh, you can see they did not identify these zones out here, but there's some very definitely up there. You actually get, by the way, um, a fairly significant inundation um, area along that river because when you get a hurricane coming in, not only do you have surge going on, uh, going inland uh, from the sea, 